Hey, yo, so this is a raw chat recorded this past weekend with returning guest Peter Biedregal. Peter and I chat about the work and legacy of recently deceased sci-fi author Gene Wolfe, who, if you don't know him or his work, is probably the best sci-fi writer you've not heard of. We also talk about sci-fi and fantasy at large, religious literature, unreliable narrators, and Game of Thrones, a pre-series finale. These chats are usually for $5 plus patrons on Patreon, but I do like throwing one out for free every now and then. If you want to hear more of these in the future, patreon.com slash culture at the $5 level is the place to do just that. Enjoy. All right, Peter Biebergall, you're back on this show for the third time, I believe. It's really That's nice to have you charm, here, man. They say. Yeah, it is the charm, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And you're here for... An interesting reason. Uh, it's it was sort of like a by accident reason too. I, I was reading a uh, a write up on the death of sci fi author Gene Wolfe about a month ago when he died in mid April, and it was uh, mm-hmm. written up by Tor, you know, one of the leading genre publishers out there. And lo and behold, they had quoted and linked to a uh, a piece that you wrote on Gene. I guess you actually interviewed him too for it. Uh, for the New Yorker, I don't know if it was published in print and online, but I definitely read it online. Just online, yeah. Okay. And, man, it was a great, great piece about him and his life and his work, and I thought, you know, who better to talk about Gene that I know of, just for a bit here, you know, in um, the wake of his death, than you, who wrote that piece and have actually spoken to him. And I also told yeah. you, via, uh, yeah, and I also told you via email that Gene was on my list of people that I have composed emails too, but never sent to oh, invite them yes. onto the show. And I could never find an email address for him though, to actually send it to him. So I never got around to it and obviously never will now, but uh, I think I must've gotten in touch with him via his publisher because I wouldn't have been able to have found it. Yeah. Either. And I, <clears throat> and I think that I did find some publishing contact for him at one point, but then just decided and I didn't want to deal with publishers at that point, you know, especially a guy who was in his 80s. He died at age 87, uh, like I said last month. And, uh, yeah, I just wasn't sure how keen he would be on talking to somebody who, you know, not really a big podcaster in this space, but, you know, more of that sort of niche audience that I just didn't know if I could lure him in and with, uh, <laughs> sure. especially, w- especially when yeah. I wanted to. I hadn't, didn't have the audience then that I have now, but... Yeah. Uh, so anyways, well, you know, so, he's, a, he's a funny character in the in the world. You know, when you look, I, I spend a lot of time on Reddit's um, science fiction related sub Reddit's. And, you know, when people are always asking recommendations of what's the best sci fi or, you know, because we, we tend to read sci fi sort of within these sub genres. Right. We're either looking for space opera or we're looking for um, hard science fiction or cyberpunk or, you know, whatever the sort of specialized area we're sort of interested in at the time. And so his name usually only comes up when people are asking for what's the most literary sci-fi or what's the most you know, what's the strangest science fiction you've read or the, you know, so it doesn't fit in, his work doesn't fit into these kind of traditional subgenres of science fiction or fantasy. And what's also interesting about his work, I think, is that he very much blurs the line in a lot of his work between science fiction and fantasy is as much as we can parse those two anyways. Because a lot of what his work may appear on the surface to be traditional fantasy might actually be uh, a far future that has devolved into a feudal situation, which then might more characterize it as science fiction. So I think in many ways he represents the total breakdown of those genre conventions anyways. And so either better just to talk about, I think, a more broad term, generally speculative fiction or fantastic fiction. And then maybe when dealing with Gene Wolfe specifically, why even try to talk about genre at all anyways? 
maybe there's a way to say that he and certain other writers within the field, as it were, are able to kind of break down those walls. The other problem is, is that we have those authors that aren't traditionally thought of as science fiction writers that dip their toes into the genre. And there's always this question of, are they merely slumming it or are they really understanding the the genre from within in a way that that allows them to maybe uh, authentically or at least honestly play with it. I know there's a lot of controversy right now about um, Ian McEwan's new book on artificial intelligence. He has a new novel out and he's, he, in a lot of interviews is basically ignored, you know, decades of, novels about artificial intelligence and robotics as if you know he's the first to kind of engage with these ideas even though he's he's essentially writing a genre novel so i think wolf is a really good both writer to try to talk about within how the genres kind of break down but also just you know symbolically as somebody who um, his work represents something that just can't be characterized in in easy ways, whether you're talking about fantasy, science fiction, or whether you're just talking about literature more generally. Yeah, and I think that element of fantasy or science fiction, especially, you know, like you were touching on that sort of feudal component, like the way that the that he creates these worlds that seem like they're, that they take place really, you know, long ago in the past, but then you kind of read through the novel and you realize, oh shit, this is actually the far future, and it's 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 a really interesting way that he plays with that, and that's I think specifically he does that in the uh, his solar cycle, the uh, book of the new sun. That's right. And, and we can talk more about that, but I, I want to give a little bit more uh, biographical data here about Gene first, you know, um, and I'm just pulling this from Wikipedia and your article on him, but he's published he he published more than thirty novels and fifty short stories won multiple Nebula Awards, Locus Awards, and World Fantasy. So, you know, there's like that balance there where you got these major sci-fi awards, this major fantasy award, mm -hmm. and he's won them both. So you can see how, like, even in, or I guess even among his peers, he's still sort of, you know, characterizes, he's kind of like straddling both of these genres in some way. So that's an interesting uh, mantle that he amassed at some point. And... You know, I also wanted to uh, read a couple things here, too, from, from what you wrote about him, and this can lead us into the larger discussion. And I think, you know, maybe you were just sort of talking around this, but maybe we can get more into it. But you said in your piece for The New Yorker that he has rarely, if ever, been considered fully within the larger context of literature. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, you know, you're not going to see him... And you're not going to find one of his stories in, you know, uh, a Norton American literature anthology, right? You're, you know, there's only been a few authors that maybe have crossed over, but that's because they maybe had a special, how do I say it, resonance with whoever was putting the list together. So the famous example, I think, is um, is Harold Bloom's a uh, canon of of western literature he includes the uh well the speculative fiction author john crowley who wrote the novels uh um little big and the egypt cycle and a number of other uh stories that are essentially fantasy and otherwise you know there's you might in that realm of those who certainly play within the speculative fields like um, Margaret Atwood or Kurt Vonnegut. But because, and I say in the piece, for the most part, Gene Wolfe's work includes those very clear sci-fi tropes like 
spaceships or swords or clones or other things that even though one could argue that he's sort of transcending those things and using them merely as vehicles to tell something about what it means to be human, that that those very tropes ground him in a genre in genre that makes it difficult for him to be taken seriously outside of the genre. And that's just has to do with the prejudices of you know those the way we break those things down anyways. But look, the truth of the matter is, I'm not going to split hairs here. A lot of science fiction is plot driven, is driven by, you know, the speculations of the future or more fantastical elements than it is by say character. And so I can understand why for the most part, a lot of science fiction isn't, may be considered what we would call literary fiction because it simply doesn't deal with the same issues, at least at a human level that you get, um, you know, from that. So for example, I, I, uh, was reading is a very good example in Philip Pullman's, uh, book of essays called Damon voices. It just came out. Have you, have you seen, you know, he's the one who wrote the, um, the Golden Compass trilogy, of which there's about to be an HBO show. Yeah, on. the uh, His Dark Materials, right? That's right. Yeah. And he said he made a distinction between something. So so he, he finds Tolkien, for example, to not be a human story. The Lord of the Rings is not a human story that it can't, you cannot find in it an identification as a reader with, uh, with these sort of psychological and spiritual states of our experience as human beings. And so for him, it fails as literature in that way. But you take somebody like Gene Wolfe, and Gene Wolfe says, um, one of the things he said to me was, you know, science fiction is just a vehicle to get to these questions of humanity, of friendship, of love of religious, um, uh, uh, of spiritual and religious uh, experiences. And so he isn't trying to create a larger mythopoetic world in which to situate his characters. He's using the, the, the speculative world simply as a way of exploring character and so because for him character is first not plot not world building not made up languages not races but rather the the human experience that i think that's what allows that if people would read him this way the bridge between genre and what we might consider what we might call literary fiction. I know that just by using that word, there's a, you know, I can be challenged on that. There's going to be a lot of people that find that sort of an offensive thing to say that, you know, genre fiction isn't literary fiction, but I do think that there is a breakdown that we can measure between plot driven world building science fiction and speculative fiction that is using the tropes and using these sort of fantastical uh, elements as a, as a way of exploring uh, character and as by extension, some, some uh, element of what it means to be human. Uh, 
Yeah. And, you know, I just want to toss out some other things too about Gene, uh, as from his humanity, I guess, just from his bio. Um, cause I have a, I have an interesting connection to him sort of here, but you know, uh, he was a combat engineer in the Korean war, studied engineering at the university of Houston. And I got a job with Procter and Gamble, which is like an hour from my house. Oh, that's uh, funny. Where he devised a means of frying molded potato shingles before they dropped onto a conveyor belt to be canned in what is now familiar as the Pringles cylinder. What the hell? That's that's interesting. Yeah, that's you know? his I legacy. Mean, you know? Yeah. So if you ever see a can of Pringles in the supermarket, you can thank Gene Wolfe for that design and that, I guess, technology in some way. And he was also a senior editor on the staff of the journal Plant Engineering uh, before he began to write full-time. He actually started writing his first uh, couple novels, I think, while he was working at this, this journal. Yep. And, and submitting short stories to, yeah. to uh, science fiction uh, journals and magazines. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Peter, I my last job before the one I have now, a few years ago, uh, was in PR, and it was for a a marketing firm that specialized in sort of like engineering fields and such. And I have dealt with the editors at Plant Engineering many times. And Oh, my gosh. Every time I would exchange emails with them, I would think of Gene Wolfe. I'm like, this, is, this, is, uh, this could have been me talking to Gene Wolfe, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So, yeah, that's just like a small personal connection. Obviously, I've never talked to Gene or met him, but it's interesting, you know, kind of a six yeah, degrees thing like there. So, yeah, so, you know, he began writing in college, um, had a little bit of success when he was doing that, but, you know, he was in his 40s by the time he published this uh, story, The Fifth Head of Cerberus, and, um, you know, that obviously is kind of what put him on the map in the genre with fans and um, other, I guess, maybe editors of of those you know, pulp sci-fi magazines that were kind of around back then. Um, and I've actually not read this story. It's it's not one I've been able to get to uh, to this point in my life, but um, it does seem like it's a pretty interesting story. I'm not really sure what it's about. I know it has some clones in it and there's some space travel yeah, and such. It's very strange. I mean, I've read it a dozen times that I still have trouble fully understanding what's what it's about. But it's 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 a deeply sad story um it it has a lot to do with identity and um and and memories of of childhood and how we create memories how can we trust those memories and i think that's a lot of you know always what he's interested in is you know one of the things that people know it about him is that he writes the unreliable narrator. But what Gene said to me is that he doesn't see them as unreliable necessarily, but simply this is the way we all remember our lives. We're only always in many ways, even unconsciously asking ourselves what's worth remembering. Right. He said, um, and specifically, I was asking him about uh, my favorite novel of his, which is called Soldier of the Mist, which not only my favorite novel of his, but one of my favorite novels. And I think a really great place to start with him, actually, as opposed to the books of the new son. And in that story, there is a Roman uh, mercenary soldier named Latro. And he has no um, memory. And so the only way he can remember what has happened is to write it, to write down everything. And so he keeps a scroll with him. And every day at the end of the day, he writes down what happened. But then he would have forgotten it the next day. So he has to read the whole scroll up to that point to know about his life and he has to keep doing that every single day. And because the scroll, because he only has so much, you know, papyrus and ink as it were, he has to be very 
choosy, as it were, about what he writes. And so one of the things Wolf had said to me is, you know, with Latro, he says, what is worth writing? What is going to be a value to me when I read it in the future? What will I want to know? And so it's not so much that he's purposefully unreliable or some other sort of uh, pathology is getting in the way of him being honest or not. It's simply that with only so much time and, and space, as it were, he has to choose what he believes is important. It may not be what's important. It may not be what we think, the re- what the reader thinks is important. And so we might wonder why some things are being left out. And then we might feel cheated because we're thinking, well, then he must not want us to know about that. Wolf would say it's not that he doesn't want you, the reader, to know or not know about it. It's just that in the moment, he's limited by what for him in that moment is the most of value. And so it really changes this idea of unreliable narrator as something that we have to be kind of um, in tension with, but rather something that we should be sympathetic with and and try to ask questions about rather than what's not being said, why is what is being said the most important thing to this character? Yeah, let me deviate from Gene just for a moment and talk more about this unreliable narrator device that you find in literature. And, you know, I am, I'm a fan of it. It's maybe my favorite sort of mechanism to use when writing a story because it is inherently human and it does ground any story i think in that sort of you know not necessarily like in the real world but it it definitely grounds it in in some sort of like real persona that you can identify with right and i'm curious though like from a genre standpoint you're much more well read in the sci-fi fantasy genre than i am is this a common trope that you find among writers in this genre? Are unreliable narrators more common than I think? Because to me, it's always been more of like a literary thing and not a genre thing. Yeah, I don't think it's a genre thing. I think it's definitely... I mean, my favorite example, other than Gene Wolfe's Soldier in the Mist, for an unreliable narrator, and also one of my favorite novels, is Remains of the Day um, by Kazuo Ishiguro. And... That's the story of uh, during World War II, uh, the butler uh, running this household of this American living in England who is involved in uh, potentially some fifth column politics, uh, maybe isn't quite aware of how, maybe is a little bit, the, the American is a little bit ignorant as to how deeply um, it goes um, in terms of being not simply trying to remain neutral, but maybe even a little bit pro Nazi. And part of it is his, in a, his completely stoic life that he's the, you know, the perfect Butler who shows absolutely no emotion. Um, But there's a, and he falls in love with this, uh, with one of the, the, who's the woman who's the head of the maids in the house. And she's constantly, you know, trying to pull something out of him that's, he, that, that's emotional. He just refuses at every moment. And the, because of that, the book is, is deeply sad, you know, because you f- know at every moment that he actually is feeling something that he's not letting you know that he's feeling right. And you can, you, you want it to crack and it just won't crack. And there's this moment, um, if you don't mind my reading you this quote from the novel, it's the one moment where he cracks and he says, um, uh, I do not think I responded immediately for it took me a moment or two to fully digest these words of Miss Kenton. Moreover, as you might appreciate their implications were such as to provoke a certain degree of sorrow within me. 
Indeed, why should I not admit it? At that moment, my heart was breaking. And there's a moment in Latro uh, in Soldier of the Mist, which is, I think, one of the also similarly to that, one of the great moments in literature. And again, I'm not a literary scholar. I'm not, you know, this is just me as a reader making these statements, you know. Um, so Latro has this friendship um, with this man uh, who's also another mercenary uh, who probably comes from uh, more of an a from an African country. And they have this friendship, but every day Latro has to meet him for the first time because he doesn't remember him from the day before. And this moment here in the novel, Latro, the, the man sees him and he comes running up to him, quote, shouting his arms in the air. And Latro writes that he does not know where we met or why I love him, though no doubt these things are written somewhere on this scroll. Without thinking at all about what I should do, I embraced him as a brother. And so these moments of where these extremely human and vulnerable moments break through what we are calling the unreliable narrator, I think only releases that tension in a way that's just startlingly beautiful, you know, when it finally, when it sort of finally happens in that way. And so does it matter that this is about a character who can see and talk to the gods or that it's a butler during World War II in a house of fifth columnists, you know? Um, and so I think when you, when you're dealing with a, with a writer like Wolf, the genre is absolutely irrelevant. And it may be, you are more interested in somebody who can talk to the gods than a world war two story about, you know, fifth columnists. And that's, and maybe that's why then you uh, you tend towards one of these kinds of novels over the other. I mean, genre still, I think, can um, align readers to their general interests, right? But to find inside of that um, these these moments of humanity that transcend the genre in any way, I think, is what makes Wolf so unique. Why did why doesn't he write a novel about World War II or about you know the Korean War, which he was in? He could have done that, or any of these more real, what we call real world, obviously historical events, but rather choosing the genre because for him there's something that allows him a more uh, open playground, as it were, right? To just explore things in a way that maybe he would feel, you know, where one author might feel too restricted by genre for somebody like Gene Wolf genre is actually the thing that liberates him from ha being able to explore character in all their sort of variety. Yeah. And you know, that quote that you shared that Gene uh, mentioned in your piece for the New Yorker, what is worth writing? What is going to be of value to me when I read it in the future? What will I want to know? You know, when I read that, the first time I reread it again last night, and then as you were just talking through it, I got the same images in my mind of like these highly curated social media feeds that we all have, right? Mm -hmm. And it just it just makes me think of 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 that for some reason. Like these are our our modern day you know uh, feeds, but they're also these scrolls that you were talking about Latro having. Is what do we want to remember the next day from the day before, and you go to your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed. And there it is. Like there's your scroll of your life. You know, if you're choosing to share that, right. And there's your, right. what you want to remember from what happened previously. So I don't know if I don't really have a point here besides that. I just wanted to throw that thought out there, 
But if you have any comment on that, please share it. Yeah, no, but I think I think it's true. But the the problem is, is we don't go back and read. We're so trapped inside the next thing, looking at the next thing. I mean, even you know, Twitter. I I often like things so that I can look at them later. Or on Instagram, I save. I have like a you know a archive of saved posts that I want to look at later. Or on Facebook, I save posts so that I can, you know, links to things. I rarely ever go back and look at them because there's always the next thing, you know? Right. And I think what, what Latro is doing is in fact saying there isn't the next thing. There's only what happened before. And there's no way for me to understand what's happening now until I go back and read the whole story again. And I think in some ways we've lost the narrative of, our days, you know, I, th- I mean, I think it's very interesting, for example, I don't want to go into politics here, but just as an example, Trump might tweet something and misspell it, right? And that will trend on Twitter. But a year or so ago, somebody in his administration wrote an anonymous piece for the New York Times essentially saying that this is a person who's completely unstable and does not listen to his advisors or read reports why are why have we ever stopped talking about that <laughs> right it's like we're only interested in the next thing and we we have this strange way of not going back and contextualizing all of it right and so i think latro for example is a reminder that everything is uh, everything is context that our lives that every moment of our life doesn't happen in a vacuum but social media makes it feel like everything is happening in a vacuum right And so I think that there really is, you know, there's no way he could have known Twitter when he was writing uh, Soldier of the Mist. Nevertheless, I think that there is something essential there that he's trying to tell us about memory and, and, and value and narrative. And that narrative is about all these things leading up to the to the moment we are at every moment and that we can't just extract these singular things just like Latro can't extract the moment of seeing this person that he knows he loves and he even says it must be written somewhere in the scroll of why i love this person <laughs> right um and so even he recognizes that it's all that if he goes back he'll see that that context. And so I think that that's I, I think there that has been lost for us in many ways. That's that, that's interesting too because what you just said there about there must be a reason why I love this person written in this scroll. When Gene's wife died before he did and he has this interesting memory of of her, you know, she was dealing with with Alzheimer's and some other issues, and she or he he would say that like she didn't know who I was, she didn't know that we were married, but she knew that she loved me, and I thought, wow, right. like that's so romantic, that's so powerful, yeah, and it's a complete echo of that novel. It is. That's what I was just ready to say. Like, it, but he wrote this novel way before that happened, and. Right. And I just yeah, as you were talking through that, it just it boggles my mind. Like I don't know, did he did he will that experience into existence cuz you know <laughs> like know. his his wife's uh scroll, like she might not know exactly who he is or why he's there with her, but for some reason that a bodily memory, I guess maybe of love Always. Or, or it's just still imprinted in the brain or in the soul or whatever, you know. I mean, he was also a devout Catholic, let's not forget. And so I think for him, you know, those those feelings of love are uh, spiritual, that they don't exist merely in the body as an emotion, uh, a chemical emotion, right? But as something that's uh, transcendent, that, that happens at a soul 
level, not merely at a chemical level, right? And so the soul would always remember what the maybe the brain can't anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know his Catholicism is something very interesting to try to inspect in his work, but I think he also does a very good job of using maybe for himself what is of concern as a Catholic, but not writing Catholic literature, not, you know, and I think this is, um, you know, Flannery O'Connor has a number of very uh, important essays on this topic that I recommend uh, to folks if they haven't read about, you know, what does it mean to be religious and to be a writer where those concerns are ever present for you as an individual. And it would be disingenuous to say that they don't come into your work, but how do you do that and not evangelize or try to prove something about your religious sentiment? I mean, it goes to the heart of that old debate, you know, of supposedly between Tolkien and C.S. Lewis about Asalan is too spot on Jesus, right? And for Tolkien, you you know, you don't want a one-to-one metaphor like that. You want to build a larger allegorical structure. And so Flannery O'Connor often makes the point that there's a difference between being a writer who is Catholic and a Catholic author, you know. Um the Left Behind series, for example, remember when those were very popular? Oh, yeah. Those yeah. are evangelical, literal, religious pieces of fiction. But they're not what Wolf is doing or what Flannery O'Connor is doing or what any number of other writers who are religious or have spiritual or religious concerns bring to bear um in their literature and so i think that in that way he's very much in the tradition of the american writer like melville like flannery o'connor like you know name any other t.s Eliot. i mean name any other you know american writer that even if they're not devoutly religious are still always having in some ways to engage with religion um, or with the religions with religious concerns or spiritual concerns, right? Yeah. And how do you do that elegantly without it turning into, you know, a Catholic or a Christian novel, as it were? Well, I guess you include, you know, drones and robots and dragons mm-hmm. and whatever the hell else you want to, I guess, sort of contextualize and characterize it. And, uh, you know, I guess Ursula Le Guin called him science fiction's Melville, so there's an apt comparison there. And <laughs> exactly, there is a uh, there is a Christ like figure in the Book of the New Sun uh, series. When I'd love to touch on that uh, just briefly here. So, you know, this is a uh, this is a series of five books that he published uh, in the early '80s, and a lot of people call it his magnum opus. It's you know, as a complete series, it's about I think two thousand pages or maybe a little less than that. But not I've not as made long it as Alan Moore's Jerusalem, but <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I don't know how many words is are in the book of the new sun. I don't know if he hit the million mark. I'm sure he did, but uh Oh not, maybe, not, yeah. Yeah, not not in that one uh novel like like Alan Moore did. Which by the way, I've not finished the Book of the New Sun <laughs> and I've also not finished uh Jerusalem either. I think I made it through sixty pages to be honest, and then I was kind of disappointed because it was kind of slow to get into and i thought man if this is how the whole million's going to be i'm not sure i can finish this thing so uh, i haven't even started it yet so uh, it's pretty intimidating yeah so uh i don't even know why i bought it i guess i bought it because of the the guy who wrote it right but yeah you know um haven't been able to get back into that yet so but I, I do want to talk about the book in the new sun and get your take on it. i don't know if you've read the whole thing or not but yep okay. although i never read earth the the the, the sort of um, epilogue book, um, which he wrote after the, I mean, I think it really is considered the four books 
And then the fifth, the earth of the new sun is sort of this epilogue. Um, and I first got that tetralogy, it's called, you know, four, as a science fiction book club book. When do you remember the science fiction book club? I mean, I've heard of it, but I was not part of it. Yeah. Oh, those were the days you would, you know, you'd pick five books for a dollar and then you'd have to, you know, choose, uh, you'd have to buy like three more books over the course of however many years, but getting that like box of five books, you know, was always this amazing thing. Anyways, I, I, one of the things I got was the book of the new sun. Uh, the the whole the whole it was in one volume, mm-hmm. and I I never I I couldn't even crack it like I did I looked at the first page I had no idea what it was I didn't it wasn't until many years later that I went back and read the Shadow of the Torturer, which I absolutely fell in love with I think that's the best of the four, um, and it's it's a very um it's very dark it's very melancholic it's filled with wonders there's many levels at which you can read it you can read it just as just what it says on the page is what is happening or you can try to investigate it and see you know what the hidden sort of riddles might be about whether or not you're dealing with the with a with a far future if we want to talk about subgenres i guess the books uh, the book of the new sun would fit into what's called dying earth literature mm-hmm. um which you know was um which was sort of a, a, a coined because of the work of um uh, jack vance and in fact dungeons and dragons magic system the original magic system for Dungeons and Dragons is called uh, Vankian or Vancian because it's mm-hmm. based on Jack Vance's magic system found in the Dying Earth novels. Um, but again, it's this idea that you are so far in the future that you are now back to magic and swords and you know, and and in 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 Wolf's work, it's often hard to know whether or not the say the weapon that you're dealing with is an a science something of science or something of magic you know you you can't always know and so that the diner genre um is you know is one that has been around for you know for some time and i think he would definitely be considered a uh, sort of part of that um if we needed to put him into put those particular books into a subgenre, yeah. And tell people a little bit about you know what the phrase "new sun" actually means, because the world that this is set in is, like you said, you know, far into the future, but uh, the sun has dimmed, right? And the Earth is a lot right. cooler. And so the idea is this sort of return, which also has this kind of religious um elements right because sun could also be s o n right uh and so um but again you can read it that way i don't know if you need to be to read it that way um but i don't think that gene was or gene wolf was trying to sort of promote catholicism via right these books like in the way the authors of the um, end time books, end time novels, you know, might be trying to actually ev- evangelize, right, for um, belief in Jesus, right? Yeah, but, you know, you did call this in your New Yorker piece a uh, Bildung's Roman, which is specifically concerned with that sort of, you know, the the spiritual pursuit or journey of the main character. So... Are you saying that you didn't read it that way or you or you only saw it that way maybe later after you read it the first no, time? No, I, I well no, I so let me take it back. There's a difference between I think reading it as a Catholic novel 
and reading it as a spiritual journey novel, right? Um, so I do think that Severian is on a psycho spiritual journey, but I don't think it's necessary to read that purely as a Catholic one or as a Christian one. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I, I just, you know, whenever I read about this book, uh, like reviews of it or people just blogging about it or whatever, I've heard a couple people on podcasts talking about it, and they always talk about it as this sort of Christ-like journey with the main character, and it's never really presented any other way. So whether that's Catholicism or, you know, general, you know, quote-unquote spirituality, it doesn't matter to me. To me, the, the journey of, of, of either one of those is very similar, right? I mean, if well, you're having this... I mean, Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the point. That's a larger point to make about the spiritual, about religion and literature. Anything that we encounter can evoke those feelings, even though they may be they may be specific to the author or the composer's own um, religious sensibility. So I can listen to the hallelujah, you know, chorus. And there's absolutely a Christian thing going on there, but that doesn't mean that I can't be moved at a more, um, I don't want to say generic level but at a more core spiritual level that doesn't require the the, the sort of christian um garment of it right even though i can recognize that it's absolutely there so i can re i can know that wolf meant severian to be a christ figure but it doesn't mean that I can't still read it as a spiritual journey and have an experience with it, whether I'm a Christian or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I, I guess I was just, you know, I, I, I guess I try to, I try to separate, or maybe I don't try to separate. I don't try to separate. Um, religions anymore and from spirituality because i think they're all very similar and i think the journey in in every body of of text is is the same and i I know you come at this from a different angle because um and correct me if i'm wrong but you have a jewish background right yep yeah so you know like how does how does that environment that you were raised in differ from you know wolf's catholicism and how does it differ from a more like I hate to say this to, or to to use this term, but a, a more sort of like new age spiritual quest, you know, like it it all seems like you're just going on that Christ like journey of discovery and you know this sort of like coming to Godhead, so to speak. Like what, where do you see the differences in like you know these these disparate systems? And we're getting into a much different discussion now. Sorry, but you know, yeah, I mean, I, it's I, important. I I don't, I think that. You know, I think there is a mistake to be made, not to say that you're making a mistake personally, but I think there's, I think there's an error to be made to suggest that, um, it's one thing to say that maybe ethically all religions have some similar sensibilities or that the core idea of trying to interact with the Godhead or have a transcendent union with the divine may be at the at the bottom of all of this i think this goes back to a lo- up somebody i quote and talk about often which is rudolph otto's book the idea of the holy which is you know really trying to um you know distill the religious experience into something that it doesn't really matter what your uh path is per se but that we're all dealing ultimately with this encounter with the, with the ineffable, right? However, a Catholic path towards that union with God is, ext- is very, very different from a, from, a, from a Jewish one or from 
a um, Golden Dawn one, right? Although the Golden Dawn one and the Catholic one might even have more. In <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking you know? that, yeah. Uh, but what I mean to say is, you know, that the, 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 that God became, that the Godhead becomes flesh in Jesus, in a historical person named Jesus, to, to believe that is a very, very specific thing, right? I mean, we could say, yes, but in the end, it still is only about this greater journey. And, and that's probably true at, at some level. But, the, but still, that belief is, is very specific and very peculiar to that, you know, larger Christian uh, theology and then made even more so in the Catholic rites with the Eucharist where you're with the, where the, the, you know, it's actually transforming, um, into the body. Right. I mean, that's, that, that's a very special way of interacting with the divine, you know, which say is very different from, Judaism and Buddhism and and certain Hindu uh, sects, right? So, so I just I don't want to. I'm I'm wary in um, in saying that you know Gene Wolfe's Catholicism, as it might play out in the figure of Severian, is. M- is re- is purely reducible to some generic uh, idea of what it means to be on a spiritual journey but that doesn't mean that you still can't read it that way you don't need to be a catholic to read it that way is what i'm getting at in the same way that i don't need to be christian to enjoy box you know work or look at a renaissance painting of of mary i don't i can be incredibly moved by that and yet not believe in the way in which a Catholic might really literally accept that Mary was born without sin so that she could give birth to Jesus without sexual intercourse. Right. I mean, that's a, Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a very, again, special thing to believe. Um, and so I, I think we have to be careful, uh, not to, you know, there's a big question going on in folklore circles right now, um, where you have somebody like Joseph Campbell, you know, who was trying to sort of find those sort of generic elements that can be found in all mythologies to say something more, uh, uh, universal about the hero's journey or about all these other ideas that can be found um within these these tales but there are folklorists who are saying you know that's all very well and good but a lot of folklore is built it it arises specifically out of things like the very things that people were eating you know where they lived or the the nature of the soil or how often it rained or you know the the relationships that they, the, the, um, sexual relationships that, that they had or the way the family was constructed and to try to, to say that those things, to, to say that there is a universalism, we have to be careful to, at the same time, not to erase what is very particular, um, about those, about those stories. And so, To bring that back to something like Severian, I think one can read Severian as being somebody who was on his own psycho-spiritual quest, but recognize and accept that Wolf himself was Catholic and was likely, and even admittedly, um, using his understanding of Jesus as a model for that. And so I think you can inhabit um, both places when you're reading. 
Well, that is fair, and I'm glad that you uh, corrected me a little bit on that. But I, I guess what I was trying to say, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but no, no, okay. was that the destination was similar. Maybe the path to getting there is different, but the destination ultimately is kind of the same. Is that fair? You know, I, I don't know. Um, believing that you, that the ultimate, I mean, if you are a particular kind of Christian and you believe that the ultimate destination is a resurrection of the physical body perfected going to heaven, um, and hanging out with your loved ones, you know, might still be very different from a Buddhist notion of the cycle of uh, karma and reincarnation, right? Um, and what it means to step outside of that wheel and become uh, a Buddha or choose to become a Bodhisattva, right? So, again, I think at the bigger alt more the more uh, I, for me the final destination it, it's less about the final destination but about that about the essential impulse that's the same and i think the essential impulse is an interaction an encounter with the divine so i think it's less about the end point or even less about the path but more about that part of us that is persistently um, and often either unconsciously, desperately seeking an encounter with divinity, however that may play out. And would you say then that Severian's story in the Book of the New Sun, that that is ultimately what it's about, that whole story? It's just about him, you know, that quest for his own truth, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Yes. In the same way it is for Latro in the other, um, you know, he's having to seek truth by writing it every single day, by reading it every day all over again and writing it anew. Um, and so, you know, that must distill to the fact that he forgets every day distills that need to something that's that's been, you know, the crucible has purified that in a way um, that we we often, we, we don't get to experience necessarily because of the way in which, you know, our lives and our memories and our experiences sort of create this, you know, this calcification. Um, but for somebody like Latro, now Severian's different. Severian remembers everything. So he's the opposite of Latro. And so what's interesting about Severian is if he remembers everything, can we trust that he's telling us everything? We, we know for Latro, he simply is doing the best he can. But Severian remembers everything. And so we have to trust that he really is giving us what's most important. But you have to remember that he's also only seeing things for the first time and maybe not fully understanding them either. He's not looking at the world as if it's our future's past. <laughs> Right. Um, he's seeing these things as moving into uh, the future, or, you know, awaiting this, awaiting the new sun. So um, there's a very interesting uh, question there of, you know, how do you distill that that essential quest, either because you remember everything or because you can't remember anything? Yeah, and I think this is a point that Gene made in your conversation with him was that like even if Severian does remember everything, he's still presenting the information to you, you know, based on his own perception of things. That's so, right. he's inherently biased, he's inherently unreliable there. So, I think this is a fascinating dichotomy between those two narrators even though essentially at the core they're both unreliable in some way. I think as we all are, right? So, right. Exactly. Um, and I just have one uh, last question for you here about Gene, and then we can maybe talk about sci-fi in general for a few minutes. But um, your, the title of this piece you wrote was that he was sci-fi's difficult genius, and I think that's a great way to describe him and to sort of wrap up this chat about him. But tell the readers, you know, just in sort of uh, closing here about Gene, like 
why he was so difficult and why he was, in fact, a genius, too. Well, I mean, genius, I guess, is the hyperbole. Um, but certainly, you know, his his not only his, the level of his output, but the quality of his output and his ability to create these these stories that are riddled with riddles is you know a remarkable feat but he doesn't make it easy i mean a lot uh, one of the things about the new sun is that he uses words that are that we you've never seen before the thing is he doesn't make up any words so he doesn't create like his own language like el, el- elvin or elvish rather but his the, many of the words he uses are so archaic that I there you, if you want to try to find out what they mean, you'd have to go to like a, probably an Oxford uh, English dictionary to find them. And sometimes even there, I don't. I, there are a few that I haven't found. Uh, some people suggest reading him without a dictionary. And to let the meaning of the words just be, uh, you know, not literal meanings but more evocative and to really uh, you know live inside this fantastical world to try to again you know understand to have a new understanding of of this character's experience and so he is difficult you know like um i like i said i even find you know what's considered his most popular story the fifth head of cerberus is 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 an incredibly challenging story. The books of the new sun get stranger, and more complex as you, as you read them, just as other things sort of start to unfold and make more sense, but they're also daunting. You know, it's not, it's one thing to look at something like, you know, um, a, a traditional fantasy series. That's going to go six books. And you know, that, you know, it's fairly easy read, plot driven, you know, lots of, uh, you know, lots of recognizable tropes, language that's easily understood in terms of if you're a general fantasy reader, knowing what an elf is or knowing, you know, what these things are. But Wolf doesn't give you that, you know, he thinks you think you're dealing with one thing, but you're actually might be dealing with another. And so he doesn't just in the book of the new sun uh, refer to traditional genre um, ideas. Now he does have a book called wizard, uh, two books called wizard and Knight, which are his, which you might call traditional fantasy books. But even there he's, he's doing something that, that that's quite different. So, um, but I recommend to people who haven't read him to start with Soldier of the Mist, then maybe read Fifth Head of Cerberus. But I, I recommend everybody at least attempt to read The Shadow of the Torturer um, and to start there, um, you know, after at least you, you've dipped your toes in with something like, uh, I think, Soldier of the Mist, which is very readable. Yeah, I have not read uh, Soldier of the Mist, so I have so many books that I want to read, both by Gene and by you know, every other writer I've been interested in. So it's just hard to get around to them all, for sure. And, you know, Gene does this thing in the Book of the New Sun that I think can bridge us into a maybe a larger sci-fi discussion here just for a moment. But, you know, he does this thing where, and I think you mentioned this earlier in the conversation, where... The setting appears, you know, sort of feudal or medieval, like it's like it's long in the past. But you work through the book or the series, I guess, and you find out that, you know, this is actually far in the future and that, you know, like these something happened, obviously. And there's there's these little details like, you know, um, I think you mentioned this in your write up for The New Yorker. Let me find it real quick. A desert sands are actually the glass of a great city. That, that that may have fallen and the the creaking steel walls that make up this sort of like you know uh room in this dormitory that Severian stays in is likely you know an ancient spaceship that they just sort of repurposed i guess and it's it's a fascinating like balancing act between not only past and present and future 
but also like between the genres itself because when, like when you talk about feudal or medieval sort of lit you're you're talking about mostly fantasy but then when you put it in the future it's in this sort of semi post apocalyptic environment right. that makes it science fiction for some reason right exactly That's so a- it's this like even in just the series of books that he that that he wrote and not just in his whole catalog but just in this specific uh sequence here he's doing this tremendous balancing act between all these uh, tropes and these genres and it's fascinating but it leads me to i think a, a greater question about these genres and maybe science fiction more specifically but you know the the sci-fi that you grew up with peter was was very much futuristic in a in a tech focused sense you know it was just very hopeful like you know technology is prevalent and it's sort of liberating but it's also confining in some way too and you know the the whole like you know sort of maybe big brother aspect to it as well but sci-fi now doesn't seem so much like that it it seems like it's all sort of teetering in this post-apocalyptic you know dystopian style almost and i'm just curious like do do you see sci-fi that way now or is that just how i'm seeing it and that's a very popular um take you know right now which is the post-apocalypse the zombie the outbreak of something the yeah end of the world and uh what resources are left but there's still there's plenty of space opera still being written you know the expanse series and um you know, I, I think I still I think the genres is is wide, but it, there is a tendency, especially in young adult uh, science fiction, to have this post apocalyptic um, sensibility. You know, right now, and I think it's because we all have that anxiety. <laughs> you know, um, you know, there's always that question: you know, where are our, where are our uh, jetpacks? Right, we were promised jetpacks, but instead we're getting you know the fear of um, you know, climate, uh, you know, uh, climate uh, catastrophe, right? And that's more yeah. real right now um, than the idea that we might have jetpacks one day. So I think that we've, in many ways, science fiction has, we lit, we are now in a future that has surpassed the science fiction of the past that was looking towards this future, right? So we've kind of teetered over to the other side where it's not so much about um, what might be possible, but how do we save ourselves? Well, that makes sense, I guess, on some level. And I I guess I was just more, more wondering why we've sort of, and I'm not, this is a bad take, but it just doesn't seem as imaginative in a positive way as it used to be. Yeah. And yeah. I, just, I mean, but you know, I mean, that's, I, I, again, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, well read on all contemporary science fiction right now. Um, so I can't, you know, necessarily speak to, to whether or not there is science fiction that is, I guess, hopeful or not, but I don't know if I'm not sure science fiction. I think science fiction wasn't necessarily hopeful when it was looking into the future. I think it was just giving us an idea of what technology might be. But like you said, there was always, it was always something we had to be wary of also. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I mean, I read, I, my science fiction as a kid was, you know, lots of Ray Bradbury and even Ray Bradbury stuff was pretty apocalyptic. Yeah, that's true. Well, well, I'm curious then, like, from, uh, do, you, do you read any fantasy then? Um, I have not been reading much fantasy lately, um, so I'm not really up on what's popular. I know that, I know about the series that are popular. I was told by a person whose taste I recommend that I should read uh, The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch. Have you read that? No, I haven't. I haven't heard of it. Um, so that's supposed to be quite good. Um, but no, I haven't, um, I haven't read a lot of fantasy lately of contemporary fantasy. Right. Are, wait, are you watching Game of Thrones? I am. Okay. Let's, 
let's uh let's give a hot take then on on season eight and i don't care if you spoil anything uh th- this is the warning i've s- i'm i mean i'm i'm all caught up but if the audience isn't then just stop listening right here but peter what's what's your take on season eight so far I don't know. I mean, I think the problem is, is that they have to rush through to the end. And so a lot of character threads are being wrapped up too tightly. I mean, my, the biggest disappointment for me is Cersei's character because she, you know, she was like the queen of, 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 um, torture and, you know, scheming. And, uh, there was something about her that was so compelling. And I think, the last couple of episodes, all she did was to stare out the window. You know, there was really nothing for <laughs> yeah. her to do. Yeah. And so I think part of the problem is, and there was an interesting article. I don't know who wrote it. Uh, I would say the LA review of books last, uh, essay about this last episode was quite good. So I recommend that. But one take that I read was why are we with these kinds of shows feel the need to quote end them? Why couldn't the show have simply ended without the big battle at King's landing? Why couldn't it have ended with the armies sort of amassing and that's the end. And we sort of have to just accept that this is a world that's just going to continue to go on as it were. But there's a Mm -hmm. sense that everybody has to have a kind of complete arc. But that's not how life or history is necessarily. So it would have been interesting to sort of end it without ending it. Um, Take a lesson from how how badly lost, you know, the show Lost Mm -hmm. did with that. This This necessity to end it and make it all make sense and bring all the pieces together, it ultimately failed. So, you know, am I enjoying the spectacle of this season? Sure. You know, but I do think that we've lost a lot of what has made these characters really interesting, especially a character like Cersei. Tyrion, I feel, has been neutered um, in many ways that I think is, you know, not to his character. Um so yeah, that's that's my essential feeling about it. But of course, I'm going to watch the episode tomorrow night. You know, sure, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm you? curious. Um, <laughs> I haven't really found as much fault, I guess, in this season as the rest of the internet has for some reason. <laughs> but I am, yeah. I guess I didn't really realize it until this last episode ended, where. It just seems like they, yeah, they are just killing off people to kill them off to give them a complete story arc. And in this world, the complete story arc is, you know, you die horribly, typically, right? So, right. And I still think, like, even though you're at the end, there's still room to develop character. And I just think they just stopped doing that. And I'm just now kind of waiting to see, you know, I think there's this, I don't know, I'm just guessing that there's this ultimate confrontation with John and Daenerys. Yeah. And I I don't really know, like if I want that, you know, like I'm just not really into having confrontation for the sake of confrontation because I have to decide, you know, who's going to rule over this kingdom when the series goes off the air. Right. I just, well, you know, I mean, that's one of the points that they make in the LA review article is LA review books article. It's not like it's going to end up in a democracy. I mean, it's still, a brutal feudal society and you're either going to end up with a king or a queen and that's an authoritarian despotic role to play whoever you are right and so what does it even mean to be a good king or a or a bad queen uh in this world right i mean even robert baratheon who was like i guess a nice guy was still a king and was corrupt in his way and was ready to, you know, fight for, to protect what was his. And so, you know, um, I just hope that it, 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 it makes that point clearly that we're not suddenly in a new, a new age, right. That this is still the nature of this, of this world. It's not going to suddenly democratize. 
Yeah, that's a good point, man. And uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't expect it to. But you know what? That'd be a hell of a twist if it did at the <laughs> exactly. end. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it would piss probably a lot of people off, too. So, yeah. anyways. Well, Peter, dude, that's all I have for this conversation. Unless you have yeah, anything more to add. Yeah. Always I, uh, great to talk, my friend. Love it. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much. Yep. Be well. Bye-bye.